Hey there, everybody, and welcome. Today, I am going to present a complete two-player playthrough and an in-game tutorial of the game Viscounts of the West Kingdom. This is a game that's currently on Kickstarter and is uh, expected to be delivered by the end of the year, but probably more likely first half of next year, the way Kickstarters go. I, I encountered this game in a somewhat roundabout way. I, I played the first game of the trilogy, Architects of the West Kingdom, and wasn't terribly fond of it. it it was okay. It was just a little simplistic for my taste. And as a result, I sort of lost interest in the whole trilogy. Uh, when Paladins came out, I didn't even bother looking into it. And then when Viscounts was announced, I didn't even bother looking at that either. Um, I guess that's one of the disadvantages of a, of a sequel. Oh, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that you bring along people who like the earlier versions but the disadvantage is that you perhaps dissuade people who didn't like earlier versions from looking at or examining more closely uh, newer versions or the sequels to the, that game. In any event, uh, that was that. And uh, then I came upon uh, one of uh, John Getz Games' uh, uh, blogs where he sort of talks about games that he's been playing of interest. And uh, he mentioned this game that he had played it, obviously, uh, digitally uh, online uh, using the, I guess, the Tabletopia version. He said it was very interesting. And he and I have somewhat similar tastes in games. The two of us are both fans of interesting mechanisms. And so he, re he rekindled my interest in taking another look at the trilogy. So I took a look at Viscounts thought it was interesting, liked some of the mechanisms, and I decided to program it. And then I said, well, gee, I should, I guess I should take a look at Paladins, too. And so I went and looked at Paladins, programmed that one as well. I really liked this game. I'm typically not a fan of, of worker placement, but this has enough different interesting uh, mechanisms and variations on the worker placement theme that I, it really appealed to me, particularly the fact that you've got different colored workers, that you can make different spots cheaper by build, uh, building workshops, and that um, you can gain additional workers by performing different kinds of actions on your turn. Uh, I don't know that I'll actually uh, present a video of Paladins because it's been around for a while now. There are lots of videos on Paladins and I'm not sure that my adding another one is going to make that would make that much of a difference. But uh, if there's enough interest, I guess I will. Let's go ahead and get started. I will explain how the game works as we play and uh, with a maybe brief introduction at the start. Uh, and I think that's enough. Let's get underway. Before we take a look at starting what happens at the start of the game, let me just say that there are lots of different things uh, happening here. There are uh, buildings that players have that they can build. There are, there are things that they can trade for along the outside of the board. There are these manuscripts that uh, can be transcribed for benefits and points, and there are workers that can be placed in the center castle. So there are actually four actions in this game, a trade action and a build action, both of which w uh, can only be performed if your Viscount is on the outside edge of the path. You'll see that'll become more obvious once we get underway. And the worker and manuscript actions can be performed if your Viscount is on the inner path of the, of the game board. The game board is composed of these five different sections that are randomized. By putting these five sections together randomly, you create a 10-sided board. I will say that I have sort of squish this board a little bit horizontally so it's a little bit it, it should be wider but uh, I had to squish it in order to make uh, 
make the player board uh, over here fit comfortably um, in the way I wanted to design this. So there, you'll notice that there are also these cards that are placed uh, on the board, and I should also point out that there are four resources in the game. Well, there's silver, which is currency, and then there are stone, gold, and ink wells as the actual resources, and these are used to perform a building action or a worker action in the case of gold or a manuscript or, or a transcription action. I mentioned there are these buildings that you can build when you perform the build action. The manuscripts, the workers get placed in the castle when you place a worker action. And there's also this virtue and uh, corruption track here on the player board. Uh, the corruption marker is on the far left, the virtue marker is on the far right, and these will converge over the course of gameplay, and if and when they collide, well, something interesting happens, and I'll talk about that uh, as we get closer to it. What's most important about the actions you're performing is the icons that are on your player board by, in the, in the, uh, by the way you play cards to your player board. You'll notice, of course, at the start, there are no cards on the player board, but there are these pre-printed icons available, and we, we'll, we'll be making use of those. The g end of the game is going to be triggered when either the debt count or the deed count in the supply falls to zero. Now, there are more debts than 12, and there are more deeds than 12, but there's a, a card that is placed at the 12th, after the 12th card that marks when the end of the game is going to be uh, triggered, at which point you'll finish the current round, there'll be one more round, and, and that will be the end of the game. So uh, when these fall to either one of these, or possibly both, fall to zero, uh, then endgame will be triggered, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll encounter that when the time comes. So at the start of the game, there are these player cards and there are these hero cards. Now, this is a, this is a game that has some deck building elements to it, uh, a fair amount of deck building elements to it. Uh, standard deck building tropes, you can, you'll be able to discard cards, destroy cards by thinning and thin your deck accordingly and add, car, add better cards. Uh, so each player starts with a deck of eight of the same standard cards, you know, pretty much low level. And at the beginning of the game, each player is going to play, uh, uh, is going to, in reverse turn order, I should say, so red's going first. So it looks like uh, uh, orange or yellow is the starting player here. So in reverse turn order, player's going to pick a pair of these cards. A um, sorry about that. I've got to more be more careful with my mouse pointer. A, you'll either you'll pick a combination of a player card, which is going to give you starting resources, and a hero card, which is going to be the one card that's going to be shuffled into your starting deck of eight cards, which will then become nine, and that'll create a little bit of differentiation between the players. So it's Larry's turn. I have to select a pair of these. Uh, and, I, and I guess I should say that I'm going to try to play through this pretty quickly. I will probably make lots of mistakes. I am not going to be kind of keeping an eye out too much for, uh, you know, I don't wanna, I'm not going to slow the gameplay down to uh, really study my study my moves and try to make excellent moves. So don't watch this to uh, see how to play the game well. Just watch it to see how to play the game. And therefore, I'm going to just choose the center pair of cards. So this is going to start me off with two gold. Remember, gold is used for a worker action. It's going to start me off with seven silver. Silver is used to buy, to recruit, and to dismiss or discard these cards that are on the uh, on the game board. We'll see that in action as we play. Uh, also, I'm going to gain a deed and I'm going to gain a debt. So, uh, as with the debts 
in the uh, other aspects of the trilogy series, uh, there are uh, deeds which can be flipped. I'm sorry, there are debts which can be flipped. If you have an unpaid debt, it's going to cost you two points per unpaid debt at the end of the game. If you flip it, it will cost you zero points. But when you flip a debt, you also get to uh, choose a resource of your of your uh, of your choice to add to your supply. Again, remember silver not being a resource in that sense. And then your acquired deeds are here. For each acquired deed at the end of the game, you'll get one point. But if you get to flip any of those, those are the flipped ones are worth three. So the, you'll notice that the flip deeds and the flip debts are pretty much worth the same in the sense that uh, they, they uh, when you flip a deed, you're going to gain two points as a result, going from one point for the unflipped deed to three points for the flip deed. You'll gain two points by flipping a debt uh, by, um, by not losing two points for your unpaid debt. Uh, however, of course, there's a, still a difference between having zero points and gaining three points. So in that sense, flip deeds are better, but to compensate for you flipping a debt, you're going to get that one extra resource of your choice. Furthermore, when the end of the game triggers, if the debts run out, then the player who has the majority of flipped deeds, in that case, what, the, what are called approved deeds, uh, the player who has the majority of those is going to gain 12 points. Um, if there's a tie, then you split the points. If the deeds run out, then the player who has the most flipped debts is going to um, get a, get that majority bonus. So there's that majority uh, that uh, that can be attained at the end of the game. Uh, okay, and it's interesting in the, the sense that it's the opposite of what runs out. So if the debts run out, it's the player with the most flip deeds that gets the bonus. If the deeds run out, it's the player with the most flip debts that gets the bonus. So there's that. It creates a somewhat of a seesaw effect over the course of the game. Okay, so I have to pick a, uh, a set of cards here, and I'm going to go with the middle set. So I'm going to get two gold, seven silver, uh, a deed, and a debt, and I'll get to place two workers in the castle in any one section of the outer tier of the castle, the outer rim. And my hero card uh, is going to get shuffled into my deck, and we'll talk about her if and when she shows up. So let me take this pair. I've gotten my seven silver, my two gold. Program took care of all that. It's now asking me where I want to place those two workers for free. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to put them in the first section. Um, okay. And now it's Alex's turn, or the orange player's turn, to uh, pick a pair of cards. So here we have uh, two... Uh, your choice of two resources, six silver, uh, three deeds and a debt, and one flipped, uh, one flipped, one of those deeds being then subsequently flipped. Over here we have one of each resource, a stone, a gold, and an inkwell, ten coins, a deed, and two debts, and two corruption to start. Uh, I think I'll go with the first... I think I'll go with the first pair of cards uh, and we'll encounter Bertha at some point over the course of the game. Okay, so, uh, oh, so Alex gets to choose two resources, um, the same or different, really doesn't matter. I think since Larry already got a head start in the castle, I'm going to grab some gold also to try to get some workers in the castle. So I'm going to grab a gold and I'll grab another gold as well. And so here you see that uh, uh, Alex is starting with uh, two deeds and one, one and a flipped deed. 
and one debt. So this is going to be worth minus two points. These two deeds are going to be worth two points, assuming they don't get flipped over the course of the game. This flip deed is going to be worth three points at the end of the game. All the points are scored at the end of the game. Nothing happens you know, during the game as far as points are concerned. Okay, so now it's Alex's turn. First phase being the card management phase. The card management phase, what happens here is that if there's a card that's in the third position in your player board, it's going to drop off and go into the discard pile, and it may cause something to happen. The other cards on your player board are then going to shift to the right, and you're going to play a card from your hand into the first position on your player card, uh, player board. Now, at the start of the game, uh, there are no cards on your player board. You're only going to play a card into the first position from your hand. And the first three cards I was dealt from my nine-card deck of uh, those standard cards and my one hero card, I got a trader, a lender, and a financier. I guess uh, the way that's spelled, it looks like financer, but I, I, I think I'll call it a financier. Uh, I have to play one of these cards to the first position, and uh, I'm going to play the lender. Now, the lender has a drop-off effect denoted by this X. So when the lender falls off the board three turns from now, uh, I'm going to be able to flip a deed or a debt. Uh, so we'll encounter that down the road. But for now, I'm going to play the lender. And the reason I'm playing the lender is for her trading icons. So she has two trading icons here. There are two trading icons pre-printed on the board. There's also one cleric, which is used for the manuscript action, one builder icon, which is used for the build action, and one noble icon, which is used for the worker's action. So as a result, you can see my program keeps a tally of my icons. I've got four trading icons, one builder, one a noble, one cleric, and no criminal icons. Criminal icons are wild, uh, and special things happen if and when you play criminals. We'll see that down the road as well. But for now, I think with my four trading icons, I'm going to want to perform a trading action. Uh, because I played this lender with a silver value of one, I can now move my Viscount one space. If I wanted to move my Viscount further, I could spend silver to get additional movement points. Uh, if I wanted to, and remember, I uh, Alex here has six silver to start. Uh, Alex is over here. Her, her Viscount is here. And I'm not going to spend any silver to extend my movement, so I'm now going to move my Viscount one space. And it has to go the whole distance. You can't go part of the distance. Now, in this case, uh, my distance is one, but I can't decide, no, I don't want to move any spaces. I have to move it at least that one, that space that number of spaces indicated on the card that I played, and additional spaces if I paid for them by uh, paying silver. I'm not paying any silver. I'm just going to move one space. So my Viscount from this position actually has to move here, staying on the outside edge of the board. Now remember, the outside edge of the board is where you either perform a trading action and a building action. I already indicated I want to perform a trading action because I've got these four icons, these four trading icons, which are these blue bags on my player board, two from my lender, two pre-printed in the third space. So I'm going to elect to perform a trade action, and that gives me four merchant or trading icons to work with. Now I can do a couple things to increase the number of those icons. I can dismiss this antagonist if I want, which will provide me with two criminal icons, and I will gain as a result, let me show you in the big version, so you'll notice I get these two criminals. That would allow me to add two more merchant icons. Remember, these icons are wild, these criminal icons, but it would also cause me to gain a uh, corruption, 
and will also cost me three silver to dismiss this. I think I'm satisfied with the four icons that I have, so I'm just going to use those. And the action that I'm performing here is this action right up uh, where my Viscount ended. You can see for every two merchant icons that I have, I can uh, gain one stone. I've got four merchant icons, therefore I can spend them. In return, I'll get two stone. So all those uh, merchant icons are spent, and now I've got two stone, in addition to the two gold I had at the, uh, from the start of the game, from my starting player card. Uh, once I'm done playing uh, that, I'm going to move on to the uh, recruitment phase. So that was the, um, there was the card management phase, then the movement phase during which you move your Viscount, then the action phase, now the uh, recruitment phase where I can actually recruit this card next to my Viscount if I want to. I can, I'd have to pay three silver and I'm going to gain a corruption because of the effect shown there in the top left, uh, right corner just from recruiting this card. Uh, however, I uh, well, I think Alex is going to go the corrupt path. So Alex is going to pay the three silver. He's got she's got six. I'll make Alex a, a woman here. So uh, Alex has six coins to start. She's going to pay three silver to recruit the antagonist. When you recruit the antagonist, it comes off the board. It goes into your discard pile immediately. You immediately. Uh, uh, resolve any of the effects shown in the upper right hand corner. In this case, I'm going to gain a corruption and I'm going to, it's going to cost me three silver. Um, and these, this is a, actually a deck of cards that it consists of 13. There are all the cards are equally split more or less, uh, into these five piles. And so when I, uh, recruit the antagonist, I'm going to reveal the card underneath it. So yes, I will recruit the antagonist. She goes right into my discard pile and I gain a corruption. When you gain a corruption, your corruption marker moves to the right. When you gain virtue, your virtue marker moves to the left. And again, I will talk more about what happens when these two things collide. It is important for all players to keep an eye on everybody else's uh, track uh, to see if and when a collision is going to take place because it's it will potentially affect everybody in the game and as a result I kind of track where the uh, where this track status is for both of the players up here so this five indicates that the uh, virtue and corruption markers on Alex's track are five space separated by five spaces so a collision occurs when this number falls to zero so that was the recruitment phase. After the recruitment phase, there is a collision phase, in the, at which point a collision is resolved if there was a collision. And then there's a draw cards phase, at which time that uh, the player draws back up to their hand limit, which in, starts off as three. That will end Alex's turn, and now we'll turn it over to Larry. And uh, so Larry is in the same boat, has to pick one card to play to uh, his player board. And I'm going to play the trader here. The trader is going to give me one merchant icon in addition to the two that are pre-printed on my board. Uh, and it's also going to give me this ongoing effect. Uh, so these effects at the bottom of the cards uh are used when the cards are actually played to or on your player board or when they fall off your player board, when they drop off. So this effect says that if and when I ever perform a trader action, I gain a coin, an extra coin. So I'm going to put that uh, trader out there. Because the amount of silver on this card is one, I can move my Viscount one space. If I want to perform a trading action, and if I move one space, I'm going to end up here, and it looks like I'm going to be trading uh, merchant icons for silver at a one-to-one -one ratio. 
which is fine with me. So I'll move my Vicon, Vicon, Vicount here one space. I will elect to perform a trade action. That gives me three icons. Uh, now there's no point in spending silver in order to gain additional icons when you're trading merchant icons for silver at a one-to-one -one ratio. I could dismiss this uh, watchman to gain an additional merchant icon. It would cost me one silver. I will say I have more of an interest in recruiting this card later in the recruitment phase and not dismissing it now. So I'm going to stick with the three icons that I have. It's going to allow me to gain three silver, but remember I'm going to gain a fourth silver because of this trader ability. So I'm going to end up with 11 silver when I perform the trade action. So I use up all the merchant icons and I end up with 11 silver. And that ends my action phase. Moving on to the recruitment phase, now I can choose to recruit the watchman. This is going to cause my deck to be shuffled. Um, normally you shuffle your deck when you run out of cards as you would in a typical uh, deck builder type game. But this is going to cause them to reshuffle uh, prematurely. And any time you shuffle your deck, you gain a corruption or you gain a virtue, depending upon whether you have any criminal icons on your player board. If you have at least one criminal icon, you gain one corruption when you reshuffle. If you have no criminal icons on your player board, you gain one virtue when you reshuffle. I'm going to gain a virtue as a result. When I recruit the Watchman, and I'm forced to perform this shuffle. Um, but one of the advantages of that is that the Watchman might get into my hand sooner rather than later because of the, re the forced reshuffle. Okay, my cards get shuffled. I gain a virtue as a result, and now I. Uh, perform the draw phase, the draw cards phase. There, nothing happens. There's no collision to uh, resolve because my uh, markers are far apart. So both of us now are five spaces apart on our track. And, uh, and I drew my, drew another card. I, I wasn't paying attention. I, I get, oh, I guess I drew my watchman. So, um, I did get the watchman in my hand, uh, as a result, that was all sort of random chance. And that ends my, uh, my turn, and now we're going to move on to uh, Alex's turn. Alex is sort of, as I said, leaning toward this corrupt route. And I guess we'll, make, we'll let Larry sort of lean toward a virtuous route, and we'll see uh, what difference that makes over the course of the game. I think Alex is also going to play her trader and use it to uh, gain the silver, that extra silver, the same way Larry did it. Uh, let me just see where she is and where she's going to end up. That's fine. Okay, so she's going to play her trader. It's going to allow me to move one space, well, allow her to move one space because of the one silver cost of that trader. Her eye count is here. She could move southeast into the inner path, or she can move east and stay on the outer path. She wants to perform a trading action. Keep note of the, take note of the fact that she's got five icons here, five trading icons or merchant icons to work with. So she's happy to move one space over here where she can trade two merchant icons uh, to gain one gold. So she is going to perform a trading action. She's got five merchant icons. Now at a two to one ratio, I'm going to be wasting one of those. I can spend silver to gain additional merchant icons. I can also dismiss this uh, tinker at a cost of two silver, but that wouldn't gain. I can't, actually, I can't dismiss this card because it doesn't contain any trading icons on it or, or any wild criminal icons on it. As a result, I can't even consider dismissing this. So my only choice here is to pay one silver to get up to six icons. And now I can trade these at a two to one ratio and gain three gold. No, I think that's good. So yeah, one, 
two, three, and my gold count is now up to five. Remember, gold is used when you're performing a worker action. So that will complete my action phase. I can now uh, decide to recruit the tinker for two gold or for two silver if I want to, and it will cause me to gain one virtue. Um, now, just because I'm on a corrupt path doesn't mean I can't gain virtue every so often. Uh, I will. Uh, I only have three silver. I'm not doing as well uh, as far on the silver front as Larry is. Um, I'll go ahead and recruit Tinker anyway. So I will. I will recruit her. And then I uh, perform the draw cards phase, and that ends and that ends my turn. And now we're going to go over to Larry's turn. His card is going to now shift over to the right, and uh, now I have to play a card into the leftmost space of my player board, just because I it looks like I still have plenty of. Uh, plenty of trading icons to work with. I am uh, and that tends to be what happens at the beginning of the game as you build up your resources. So I'm going to play my financier. Now the financier has some immediate effects that happen when I play her to my player board. I'm going to first of all be allowed to discard a card and then I'll gain two silver immediately. So I'm going to go from 10 to 12 silver as a result. So I'll go ahead and play the financier. She's also going to give me one additional trading icon for a total of uh, four trading icons, or four merchant icons as they're called. Now I get to discard one of these cards, uh, which just means that it, uh, I'll draw more during the draw cards phase and get through my deck a little bit faster. What do I want to discard? Uh, let me just see where I'm going to be ending up if I perform a trade. I'm going to be moving three spaces. One, two, three. So I'm going to be destroying. Hmm. In that case, I'm going to actually discard my Watchman with plans to destroy my Squire when I perform the trade action. Again, that will become obvious in a moment. So I'm going to discard the Watchman. Watchman goes into my discard pile. Never got to use him, but hopefully I'll get to use him later on in the game. And now I, because the financier that I played to my player board has a silver value of three, I have to move my Viscount three spaces. I can spend silver if I want to to go additional spaces, but I'm just going to go those three. And I'm going to stay on the outer path because I want to perform a trade action. So that's one, two three and now i'm at the space where i can trade three to one uh for the ability to destroy a card so i'm going to perform a trade action that gives that that i have four merchant icons to work with one for my financier one for my trader two pre-printed on my player board and I can spend silver or I can dismiss the strongman. Now the strongman has two merchant icons on him. And I could dismiss this card for two silver to gain those two icons and gain a virtue as a result. And since I'm on a virtuous track, maybe I will dismiss the, um, the strongman because it would I could either spend two silver to gain two merchant icons, or I could spend the two silver by dismissing the strongman. Uh, alternatively, I could decide to retain the strongman and recruit him later on, but I'm happy enough to dismiss him now and see what uh, other card he reveals. So I'm going to dismiss the strongman for two silver to gain two more merchant icons, which is now going to allow me to destroy two cards. Well, there's only one card in my deck, so one of those cards, to the, let me actually select the actual action here. So I get two destroys. The first one's going to be this Squire. I'm just going to dump him. So now my deck is going to get thinned by one card. So this Squire is now removed from the game. 
And now I get one more destroy because I had a total of six merchant icons and a three to one, I get to destroy two cards. Well, I have no cards in my hand uh, to destroy. However, you can always destroy the top card of your deck randomly. Now, since my deck consists of pretty mundane cards, and I know my the good card that I recruited so far is in my discard pile, so I have no risk of destroying uh, that card, uh, I could go ahead and safely decide to discard the top card of my deck randomly. And that happened to be my thief. Now when you destroy cards, you also gain silver in the amount shown on the card. So I got two silver for the squire, and I got one silver for the thief, so my silver count was increased by three, and now I'm at 14 silver. And I revealed the lookout, uh, which is a who is a criminal. So I'm going to move on to the act uh, to the recruitment phase, and um, well, interestingly, the lookout has an immediate effect of a um, of a reshuffle when I recruit or dismiss this card. And so if I recruit him, I am going to uh, immediately reshuffle my cards again and again gain one virtue. I'm okay with that. So I am going to, and, the, and, he, and he only cost me one silver. And he has some interesting effects there that happen when he's played. Uh, so I, I will say yes, I will recruit the lookout for the one silver. I reveal the, uh, I shuffle my deck, I gain a virtue as a result because I have no criminals on my board. And I reveal the swindler. Okay, I drew my card, so I drew back up to three and I got my lookout in my hand as it turned out. Uh, and now I'm going to end my turn. And now these cards shift over on Alex's board. And Alex is going to play a card from her hand. And again, she's got a plethora of, of merchant icons. She's got three on her player board. So her tendency is going to probably to go with this financier as well. So she's going to play the financier. She gets to discard a card. Um, and uh, she'll discard. She'll discard the thief for now. Uh, yeah, she'll discard the thief. And then she gains two coins, so she's back up to three. Did I get my two coins? Yeah, increase silver by two. Okay, so I got my two silver for the other effect of the financier. Financier. And now I have, um, and now I have to move my I Viscount three spaces. I wasn't actually paying attention. Where am I going to end up? One, two, three, right here, which is fine because I'm in desperate need of silver. So I'm going to move one, two, three spaces where I can trade one merchant icon for one silver. So I'm going to perform a trade action with my four merchant icons and uh, my trader is uh, still on the board so i'm going to gain five silver as a result of this trade boosting my silver up to eight and i'll continue on to the recruitment phase where i can now decide if i want to recruit the enforcer who is a card uh, with two noble icons on it uh, and I think that I, I do want to have this card in my deck because I do plan to perform more worker actions later on because I have a nice supply of gold. So yes, I am going to recruit the Enforcer and uh, I'm going to have to take a debt as a result. But the immediate effect up there in the upper right corner of the Enforcer's card was to gain a debt. So now I've got two unpaid debts. Uh, two uh, deeds and one flip deed and I drew back up to three and I now in my turn and we move on to Larry's turn. I guess I'm tempted to play 
either my journeyman or my lender. So I'm going to play the journeyman. I now have four icons on my player board. Now I have to move two spaces. One, two, stay on the outside track, perform a trade action. I've got four icons to work with. Uh, do I want to consider spending silver for more icons or I could spend silver to dismiss this jeweler and gain a virtue for two silver? Uh, yeah, I will go ahead and dismiss the jeweler for two silver for two more icons and a virtue. Okay, my merchant count now goes up to six. I gained another virtue. I'm close, two spaces away now from a collision happening. With these merchant six merchant icons, I can trade two to one to gain ink wells. So I'm going to gain three ink wells as a result. Okay, I've got three ink wells now. And uh, we'll continue on to the recruitment phase where I can now decide if I want to recruit the traveler. For two silver, for for a card that has two uh, merchant icons on it, as well as the ability to use two merchant icons to gain a cleric icon. So I will recruit the traveler. It's going to cost me two silver, and I'm going to gain a virtue immediately. So it's going to put me one space away from triggering a collision. For now, we're going to end Larry's turn and move on to Alex's turn. The lender is falling off the board, and the lender has a drop-off effect that allows uh, Alex to either flip a deed or flip a debt. Flipping a debt will also sort of allow you to gain two points and also gain a resource of your choice. I think for now, I, uh, I do want to get that resource, so I will flip a debt. And I, what do I want in return? Well, I've got two stone. I've got five gold. I have no ink wells. I think I'll take a third stone. Okay. We're now playing a card. So all my cards have now shifted over. My lender has dropped off into my discard pile. No, I think we can do something a little different. I will play my laborer. So my laborer has a builder icon on it. So now I've got two silver icon, two merchant icons and one builder icon. The silver value of the laborer was two, so I have to move two spaces. And I will move one, two, staying on the outer path. But I'm going to go ahead, because I just collected some stone, I'm going to go ahead and perform a builder action, a build action. Again, when you're on the outer path, you either do a trade or a build action. I've got one builder icon to work with, because I only have one builder icon on my player board. I've got plenty of stones. I've got a choice of three different types of buildings I can build. I can build a workshop with three builder icons, a trading post with five builder icons, or a guild hall with seven builder icons. And uh, I really am only close to getting to three, so I'm going to be building a workshop. Uh, I can pay stone. To, i got to get up to three builder icons. I can certainly pay one stone to get to two. Do I want to pay another stone, or do I want to dismiss the swindler for uh, three silver and a, a corruption? That's pretty expensive because it's only going to provide me with one icon. But I will dismiss the swindler. I've got five silver, so I've got enough to work with. So I'll pay three silver to dismiss the swindler. That gets me a, a criminal icon and a corruption. I got the corruption. And now I've got that third icon to work with. Remember, criminal icons are wild. So I've got now three builder icons to work with. 
and uh, that's enough to place a workshop. Now I can place this one and get a, an, a bonus to discard a card. I can place this one and get a bonus that gains me a virtue during a collision, which is uh, something to consider knowing that uh, we're pretty close to a collision happening here. But this third workshop gives me the ability to increase my handle limit by one. My current handle limit's three. Uh, that would get me up to four. That's a pretty big deal when your deck is as small as it is. So I'm going to place this workshop for three builder icons. And I have to place it on a building spot, which is one of these uh, boxed spaces near my Viscount. So I can either go here and destroy a card or go here and gain a deed. I will gain a deed. Okay, so there's my workshop. Now we move immediately on to the uh, recruitment phase. You can only build one building when you're performing a build action. Do I want to recruit the peddler for three? Ooh, a card that has, it's going to cost me two uh, silver, but the peddler has three trade icons of virtue benefit when you recruit and uh, a collision benefit. This is, so this is a benefit if the peddler is on your player board and when a collision occurs, you gain an inkwell. That's what the bottom of the card is saying there. So yes, I will go ahead and take uh, the, the peddler and recruit him into my discard pile for two silver. So I'm now completely out of silver. But I did gain a virtue, so I'm now two spaces away from a collision occurring. And you can see my hand size is now bumped up to four. So I've got a bunch of cards in my discard pile, no cards in my deck, and a hand of four cards. So I'm also close to a reshuffle, at which point uh, I would gain a virtue because I have no criminals on my player board. Uh, Alex is going to end her turn and turn it over to Larry. So Larry's trader fell off the board with no effect. There was no uh, drop-off effect at the bottom of that card, so nothing happens. Uh, I have to play a card to the left space of my player board. As much as I'd like to move on and perform a non-trade action, I still, just because of what I have here in my hand, where am I? I'm up here. Yeah, I'm okay with that. So I'm going to go ahead and play the lender. Remember, the lender has a drop-off effect that allows me to flip a deed or a debt when she drops off my board a couple turns from now. For now, nothing happens, but I can move one space because the lender has a value of one. So on my Viscount, I'm going to stay on the outer path. Well, I have to stay on the outer path from this space. I can move here. I'm not going to spend any additional silver. I'm going to perform a trade action here, which is going to allow me to trade two for one for stone. I've got five merchant icons on my player board, as you can pretty much see. And I can either dismiss the mason for one silver to gain another merchant icon, which would allow me to... Uh, also rearrange the cards on my player board. That's what that effect is on the top right corner. Or I could simply pay one silver to bump my icons up to an even number. I think I'll just pay a silver to get up to six. Yeah, two for one, I'll gain three stone. Okay, I've got three stone now. I'll continue to the recruitment phase. I can decide to recruit that mason for one silver, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. And that's going to give me this immediate ability that will allow me to rearrange the cards on my player board if I want to. Uh, well, we can move the financier over here. And now that's going to allow me to get this drop-off effect from the journeyman sooner. 
rather than later, and I'm okay with that. So let's stick with this arrangement of cards, and uh, we'll continue. So now uh, that we're going to now end Larry's turn and move on to Alex's turn. So the traders falling off doesn't have a drop off effect. The other cards shift over, and now Alex has to play a card. Can play Bertha for this immediate effect of either moving a worker. Of course, I've got no workers in the castle to move, or gaining a virtue. Um, and Bertha provides me with one trait, one merchant icon, and one noble icon. I, I will go ahead and play Bertha. And as I said, I have no workers in the castle to move, so I will just elect to gain a virtue. So I'm also I'm very close to a collision here as well. And Bertha had a, a silver value of three, so I can move three spaces. And I have to think about what kind of action I want to perform. Now I've got two, two builder, a uh, two stone and five gold in my collection here. And I've got two merchant icons, one builder icon, one noble icon on my player board. I can move three spaces. I am going to move to the inner path. So from this space, I can go here. Then one, uh, have two more spaces. I'll go here. And then I'll go here. And now I'm going to elect to perform a worker action. And when you're on the inner path, you either perform a worker action or a manuscript action. I have no ink wells, uh, to, so I really can't perform a manuscript action. I will go with a worker action. I've got one noble icon to work with. Now I can, with one noble icon, I can pl icon I can place one worker. If I had three noble icons, I could pay, uh, place two workers. With five icons, I could place three, and with eight icons, I could place four. Uh, I have a lot of gold here, so I think I will pay four gold to get up to five icons. So with five icons, I'm going to be able to place three workers. The three workers are going to get placed here in the outer tier. And anytime you place workers or move workers, you have to immediately process the workers in the castle. And by that, what I mean is that you look around the tier one and see if there, if you have three work, three or more workers in any one of the tier one sections. By placing three workers in this tier one section here, I will have three workers. And what happens is that one of the workers gets moved down into tier two. I'm going to gain two virtue. One of my three is then going to move here, and one of my three is then going to move here. So you then continue to look and say, is there anybody, any space on the tier one where a player has three workers? That's not going to be the case uh, at that point. Nobody's going to have three workers uh, in the tier one. You then look to see if uh, anything in t anybody in tier two has three workers. Nobody in tier two is close to having three workers. Then you look to see if any of the spaces uh, in tier one contain four or more workers, regardless of color. And when that happens, then the player gets to bump people off the track. Um, in exchange for resource. As a result of gaining those two virtue from here, from this uh, second tier benefit, I'm going to cause a collision to occur. So the first virtue I gain is going to cause my virtue marker to uh, hit my corruption marker. And at that point, as I gain virtue or corruption, they are going to move in concert. So they will both move one space to the left when I gain my second virtue, and then we're going to resolve the collision. So here we go, forming the worker action. Three workers get put into the tier, joining Red's two workers. Because I have three workers in one section of the castle, 
One drops down, one moves here, one moves there. The one that moves down, that's going to happen first. That's going to cause me to gain two virtue. When I gain the first virtue, they, the collision occurs, but I won't resolve it until the collision phase. I'm now going to gain another virtue, and these two markers together are going to move one more space to the left because of that additional virtue I'm gaining. Okay. Then one worker moves left, one worker, work, one worker moves right. Like so. So that's how my workers ended up, and Red's workers are unaffected. No other processing occurs of excess workers because there are no spaces now where there are where one player has three or more workers, or one space has four or more workers of any regardless of color. So that will end the action phase. What happens during the resolve collision phase? The first thing that happens is that wherever your markers ended up, the player who caused the collision to occur gains whatever is shown above the position of his or her markers. So I'm going to gain this stuff at the top, two deeds and a silver, which I desperately need. Every other player is going to get what's shown on the bottom, which is one corruption if they have one or more criminal icons on their board. Well, Larry doesn't have any criminal icons on his board, so he's going to be unaffected by this collision. Nothing's going to happen. Then your icons are reset. You then move on to the draw cards phase, where you draw back up to your hand limit. Uh, my hand limit is four, so I should... Uh, Yep, there's my fourth card. I also gained a virtue because my cards happened, needed to be shuffled. Uh, and I have no criminals on my board, so that's why I gained a virtue as a result of the reshuffling. And my turn has now come to an end. And as we re recall that I rearranged the cards on my deck to cause a drop-off effect to occur here. So let me pause when that happens. So here's Larry's... Uh, player board at the start of his turn, the journeyman is about to drop off and his drop off effect will occur, at which time Larry will be able to recruit any card from the board for free and Larry will gain a virtue and will cause a collision to happen later on in the which will get resolved later in his turn. Okay, so the journeyman drop off effect. I get to choose a townsfolk to hire to recruit for free. What do I have to choose from? Five different criminals is what I have to choose from. Oh, uh, and Larry's the one who's taking the virtuous path, so criminals are not really what I want. I'll take the conspirator. Okay, and I also... Uh, the conspirator has an, a drop-off effect, a, a, a rather a an effect shown here that lets me to allows me to discard a card. So by recruiting the conspirator, I now discard a card from my either my hand or the top of my deck. Uh, I will go ahead and discard, I'll discard the lookout because I'm sort of taking this virtuous path so criminals are not really what I'm looking for. So I'm going to discard the lookout. I also gain one virtue. Collision will get resolved later in the turn. Now Larry has to play a card to his player board. So I'm going to play the laborer to my player board. The laborer has a silver value of two, which allows me to move two spaces. So I'm going to stay on the outer path because I want to um, uh, I want to build. I think I'm going to go this way to the inner path for one space, and then for my second movement point, go back to the outer path and end up here to perform a build action. 
and now I've got one builder icon. I'm going to need at least three to perform a build action. I can uh, dismiss the racketeer for one icon at a cost of two silver, but I think instead I'm going to pay two stone to get up to three builder icons so I can place my third workshop the same way that Alex played her third workshop, and that way I'll gain, I'll get my, uh, my hand limit up to four cards as well. I don't want to be at that same disadvantage. So I'm going to take this workshop and I'm going to place it on this space here that I kind of had my eye on, which is going to allow me to gain one resource of my choice. And I'm going to choose to gain a stone. Since I just spent stone and I'm down to one, I'll gain one more stone and get it back up to two. So now I have a nice assortment of resources here, allowing me to perform just about any action that I want, depending upon what kind of icons I have on my player board. Do I want to recruit the racketeer, a criminal? Not really. That's not what I'm going for, so I'm going to pass on that. Then the collision is going to get resolved. I'm going to gain three deeds and a silver because this is, happens to be where my collided markers happen to be. Okay. Uh, that was three points for that, those three deeds. Alex is not going to gain a debt because he doesn't have any criminals on his board. Then my markers get reset to their normal position. I draw back up to uh, my hand limit, which is now four. There it is. And I had to reshuffle my cards. You heard that. I, there was, when you reshuffle, you check to see if you have any criminals on your board. I didn't have any, so I gained a virtue. So uh, I've already moved my virtue marker uh, to the left, and that ends that turn, and we turn it back over to Alex. And notice, by the way, that the deed count, because of that huge amount of deeds that I just collected, the deed count is really close to zero. Uh, so uh, we're, we haven't triggered the end of the game yet, but uh, unless a bunch of debts start happening as a result, uh, then it, sound, it looks like the deeds are going to fall to zero before the debts fall to zero. And that means that, remember, those majority points are going to earn by the player who has the most flip debts. I have no flip debts, and Alex has one flip deck debt. So I want to try to remedy that, and I know I will be remedying it next turn when the lender falls off my flip player board. And I, in the same way, when she fell off, Alex's player board, I'm going to be able to flip a debt then too and tie up the number of debts. Like i got to keep an eye on that. But for now, I'm just ending my turn and we're moving on to Alex. The financier is falling off and the financier did not have a drop-off effect. She had an immediate effect which occurred when she was played to the player board. Uh, Larry's other cards get shifted to the right. And uh, I'm sorry, Alex's uh, other two cards are shifted to the right. And now Alex has to play a card. And I'll go ahead and play the Squire, I think. That bumps my Noble icons count up to two. And now because of the two silver, I move two spaces. And I think I still want to do a build action. So I'm going to move here and then here. I like to do a build action. I've got one builder icon for my laborer. I can dismiss the swindler, but that's pretty expensive. And I only get one icon as a result of it, so I'm not going to bother. I will pay my two stone to get the builder icon count up to three. And with those three builder icons, I can construct another workshop. I can either construct this one to discard a card or this one 
to get a bonus when a collision occurs. Now, at this point, everybody's icons are sort of far apart again. So a collision's not going to happen for a while, but if the rate collisions seem to be happening, um, I'm tempted to play this workshop. I don't think I've got anything that... Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'm going to construct this workshop and I'll put it, I'm going to pick one of these spaces here. I can gain a virtue or I can gain an inkwell. Uh, I will gain an inkwell, I think. Yeah. So I'll gain an inkwell, and then I have this benefit that occurs when collisions occur, but that doesn't happen. That won't happen now. I've drawn back up to four cards, and I'm ending my turn, and we're turning it over to Larry. Can't remember. Did Larry have a card? Yes, Larry had the lender falling off. Okay, so the lender is falling off my board, dropping off, which is going to allow me to flip a debt or a deed. I am going to de definitely flip a debt because I want to stay in the running just in case this is what falls to zero first. So now we both have one flip debt. Uh, by As a result of flipping a debt, I can gain a resource. I'm going to gain a gold. Now I have to play a card to my player board because the other cards have shifted to the right. I'm going to play Emma. She immediately gives me a cleric icon and also this ongoing effect that says for every gold or stone I pay, I can gain a cleric icon. That's, of course, if I'm performing a manuscript action. Uh, she has a value of three, which moves my Viscount three spaces. And as a result, I am going to move here, here, then here for those three spaces. And I'm going to now, I'm on the inner path, so I'm going to perform a manuscript action. I could perform a worker action. I've got three gold to spend. Fortunately, I have no worker icons. But by performing a manuscript action, I have one cleric icon at my disposal, I can spend a gold or a stone or inkwells to gain cleric icon, additional cleric icons. I only need three cleric icons to, to transcribe this manuscript here, which is going to allow me to immediately gain four silver. Uh, so I have one cleric icon from this card. Okay. Do I want to pay gold or stone, or do I want to just pay ink wells? I'm just going to pay my ink wells. So I'm going to pay two ink wells to ignore Emma's special ability. That gets my cleric icons up to the necessary three. I'll now spend those to uh, transcribe this manuscript. And what happens with manuscripts is that you are doing some set collection, either by trying to uh, uh, gain three uh, of the same color of ribbon of manuscripts. So this is a blue one. I, t I'm, I, I, w I decided to do this because I saw that there was a second blue one on the board. You also gain points. Uh, by, so when you gain three of a kind of the same color, you get a, what's called a cleric bonus card, which gives you some points and some additional icons to play with. Uh, if you uh, uh, get three black ribbons, you gain an inkwell bonus cleric bonus card. Uh, if you have three yellow ones, you get the but you get the point. There are there are what I think there are four different color ribbons. There are four different colored cleric bonus cards. You also get points for gaining diff different colored ribbons. We'll start with this one and go from there. So I'm going to gain that one manuscript, reveal another one. And uh, do I want to recruit the debt collector at a cost of two silver? 
Not really, because I, again, I'm the player who's sort of trying to stay virtuous. And, all, and the only choice of cards right now are criminals. So I'm going to say no. I draw back up to four. And I end my turn. And we turn it over to Alex. And I don't remember what Alex was dropping off here. The, uh, the laborer, which does not have any drop-off effect. So laborer leaves. The other cards move over. Two noble icons. And if I play the enforcer, two more noble icons. That's... That's too good to pass up. So I'm going to play the Enforcer. Now the neg the the disadvantage of, of playing the Enforcer is that uh, I uh, if I do perform a worker I a worker action I will gain one corruption, but that's okay. I'm not close to uh, a collision just yet, and I'm sort of on a corrupt path anyway. So I will go ahead with the Enforcer. And now I move three spaces. So I'm going to just go one, two, three, and end up there. Select a worker action. I've got four noble icons. I need a fifth one to get three workers. And I can do that just by spending a gold, or I could spend a silver to dismiss the scoundrel. Uh, I'm really low on silver. I think I'm just going to stick with the, uh, pay the one gold to get up to five noble icons, which is going to allow me to put place three workers, one of which will go here, one will go here, one will go here. And I'm going to either gain a gold or move a worker. That's the benefit when I move into the second tier. So let's go ahead and spend those. For now, I think I'm happy with just gaining a gold. Then one, car, one worker moves uh, counterclockwise, one moves clockwise. Actually... That's counterclockwise. That's clockwise. And now, do I want to recruit the scoundrel for one silver? No, because I only have one silver to my name. And I'm not in dire need of the scoundrel. So that will be that. Draw back up to four. End my turn. And turn it over to Larry. Larry's financier is dropping off. No drop-off effect. Okay, what card do I want to play? Uh, I think since I've got this blue manuscript, I, I have my eye on getting this one as well. There are no other blue manuscripts on the board currently, but maybe when I take this one, I'll reveal another blue one. You know, the odds are pretty decent. Uh, what am I moving? Um, I have to play a card first. So uh, if I want my eye here, my eye on this, I've got to move one or two spaces. I will play the Abbot for the Cleric icon to move two spaces. So I'll move one space to the outer path. Oh, so I have to spend some silver, but I've got plenty of silver. I'm going to spend one silver to increase my movement points to three so I can go one two three and end up where I wanted to be but I ended up in the same space as uh, one of my opponents were by, by, by counts or my opponents by count this is only a two-player game when two Viscounts end up in the same space then the other Viscount that was in the space uh, where you moved into gets to rearrange his or her cards on uh, his or her player board as she sees fit. So Alex now has the ability during Larry's turn to rearrange the cards on her player board. She has no cards here that have a drop-off effect uh, and certainly wants to keep the Enforcer in play for now for his two worker icons. I don't really care... Eh. I don't really have any need to rearrange the cards on the player on Alex has no need to rearrange cards on her player board. So she's going to not 
do any rearranging. She's going to skip that little benefit. Back to Larry. Does he want to perform worker action or manuscript action? He definitely wants to perform a, a manuscript action. He's got one cleric, uh, two cleric icons. Okay. He needs three to get this manuscript. Uh, and he can spend one inkwell. Or he could dismiss the scoundrel for one silver to gain an icon. Uh, I'll dismiss the scoundrel for one silver. I've got plenty of silver. So, uh, that will give me a side benefit of, uh, a discard ability. So I have to discard one of my cards. I will discard the traitor. I don't, yeah, I'll discard the traitor. And now... Uh, I've got the three cleric icons that I need. I will go ahead and transcribe this manuscript for those three icons. That's going to give me another blue manuscript and the ability to hire, recruit a card for free. And uh, I've revealed this charlatan who is not a criminal and has two builder icons on it. I'll, and and worth three silver normally. I'll recruit that for free. Reveals a deacon in its place. Now it's my recruitment phase. Do I want to recruit the deacon for two silver? Um, well, since I know that I want cleric icons, yes, I think I do. So I will recruit the deacon. Okay, draw back up to four. And it is Alex's turn. Uh, Bertha's dropping off, no uh, drop off effect. Card shift, up, move over. What does Alex have in mind this turn? He still has two worker, uh, two, uh, three noble icons on his player board. So I'm looking to stick with a my worker actions and I think I will play my antagonist so my antagonist which I I think it was a card that I got from the at the start of the game and I'm finally getting being able to play it so when you play a criminal to your player board some things happen first of all you get the immediate effect uh, I'm sorry the you get this effect at the bottom of the card so I'm gonna gain a debt but you also gain one corruption for every criminal icon on your player board, including the ones on the car on the card that you played. So there's going to be two here. I have no other criminal icons on my player board. So I uh, so I'm going to gain two corruption. So my markers are going to get pretty close, but they're not going to collide just yet. I am going to gain a debt. My debts are up to two. And now I get to move three spaces. And I want to, I'm aiming to perform a worker action. I can move here, here, and then here for three spaces. And this way, when I perform my worker action, I'm going to put three workers to join these two. And uh, these five icons are going to allow me to place three workers. I have one gold. I can dismiss this for one icon, so I can't get up to eight icons. Uh, so I'm going to have to just stick with placing three. So let's go ahead and do that. Three workers get placed, one drops into the second tier, at which point I can perform a hire or destroy a card. So I am desperately in need of silver. So I'm tempted to select destroy a card, but hiring or recruiting for free is also pretty nice. 
Um, I can get two silver by destroying one of these cards. If I was going to recruit somebody, who would I recruit for free? I might recruit the courier because the courier has three icons, merchant icons. And I'm going to need to do a trade action pretty soon. Recruiting the courier is going to cause a reshuffling, which is going to cause me, because I have at least one criminal icon on my player board, going to cause me to gain one corruption, causing a collision. So I will recruit. the courier for free my collision occurs so i got one corruption from the enforcer one corruption from the reshuffle so that moved my corruption my corruption and virtue icons one more space to the right so i moved one and then in a second space that's going to gain me three silver and two debts uh, my debt collection here is not so great and then larry is going to gain one virtue assuming he doesn't have any criminals on board and i'm pretty sure he doesn't he does not so uh, larry's going to gain a virtue as a result of this collision but those three silver really make a huge difference for me so let's make sure all that worked correctly resolving collision alex increased silver by three Increase debts by two. Larry increased virtue by one. Alex's markers reset. Okay, so that all worked exactly the way it was supposed to. We turn it over to Larry's turn. Larry's labor is dropping off, no effect. Other cards move to the right. And now, what is Larry? Does Larry want to do another uh, manuscript action? Because he's got these two clerics still on his player board. I think so. Unfortunately, there's no blue. Yeah, revealed a gray. That's unfortunate. Okay, well, I'll just have to aim to get. Um, oh, this one's expensive too. It costs seven icons. So the manuscripts that are on the top of the deck happen to be starting manuscripts so they you know they're always going to cost three uh cleric icons then as other ones start appearing below those uh, you can you start getting a variety so you can see that this one costs seven icons this one costs seven but i still have three starters over here um uh, so what card do I want to play? Do I I have no cleric icon cards with cleric icons? And I don't want to play a criminal. I can play my traveler. The traveler has a benefit that says I can get a cleric icon from two merchant icons, and the card itself has two merchant icons. So there's my third cleric icon, I think. Yeah, that's an ongoing ability. So I am going to play the Traveler. And I have three merchant icon, uh, three cleric icons, two actual ones, and a virtual one, thanks to my Traveler. So I, and I have to move two spaces. So two spaces to perform a manuscript action would be here. So that's fine. One, two. It looks like I'll be transcribing this yellow manuscript for three cleric icons, and that's going to allow me to gain a um, a resource of my choice. Manuscript. Take the manuscript. So it was a yellow. I decide to gain. Uh, I will gain another inkwell since I've sort of on a manuscript kick now oh and i revealed a blue manuscript unfortunately to get it i have to recircle the board and we know we're kind of running out of time although uh larry's col uh, alex's collision caused this number to start falling hmm 
Okay, I am going to take an inkwell as my free resource. I don't want to recruit the racketeer. Not interested in the criminal. Draw back up to four. I am aiming to try to get this third blue manuscript, if I can, before the end of the game. And uh, we've sort of been near the end of the game here for a while, but uh, Alex is three spaces, uh, six spaces away, so he, she's not colliding anytime soon. So hmm, maybe it will still be a while. Okay, Alex's turn. The squire's dropping off, no effect. The other cards move right. Alex is going to play. I think I'm going to have to stick with the trade action so i'm going to play the journeyman and the journeyman has a drop off that drop off effect of uh, allowing me to recruit for free and gaining a virtue later on but that won't happen for a couple turns yet okay that leaves me with four trader icons merchant icons but first i have to move two spaces and uh, where is that going to put me so where am i i'm here i've got to move back out to one two it's going to be here trading for stone uh or i can move here and here and trade for gold uh i think i want gold more than i want stone so i am going to move here and then here do a trade action I've got four icons that's good for two gold at a two to one ratio so go ahead and spend those for two gold which means that a worker action is probably in my future at some point uh, I will continue I have the option to recruit the racketeer I am going to with four silver I'm still going to pass on that Draw back up to four. It's Larry's turn. Larry's Emma is dropping off. No effect. Other cards have shift right. I can play the journeyman and get a th another cleric icon thanks to my traveler benefit. So I think I will. I'll play the journeyman. That's good for now. Three cleric icons still. One real one and a virtual one here and a virtual one here thanks to the traveler's benefit I have to move two spaces which is going to put me here which means I'm going to be getting this yellow manuscript I could spend silver to come all the way around to definitely get the blue one but I need four icons for that I have three and I can spend an inkwell to get to four do I want to spend the silver now to circle the board or do I want to just do that later so if I go this way and end up here I need to spend a silver because that's three spaces or I could do one two three four spending a lot of silver to come all the way around or silver to come all the way around to get back here I've got a set of two different colored icons. If I get a gray one, that's a set of three. That's worth nine points. Three different colored icons. That's worth more points than getting the cleric bonus card. I think I will spend one silver to get another movement point, and I'll go this way, then this way, and then this way and to grab this gray manuscript so i'm grabbing all the starter manuscripts and i've got three cleric icons to spend and this is going to gain me a virtue do i want to recruit the swindler i do not draw back up to four i'm close to a reshuffle Therefore, I'm close to a, a, uh, a collision. When my, co when my collision occurs, I am definitely triggering the end of the game because I'm over here at this end, and I'm going to be getting gaining a bunch of deeds. So, um, 
So I know we're really caught. Probably on my next turn, I'm going to have to think about coming all the way around to either gain this, this card or this card. I'm sorry, this manuscript or this manuscript. This one's worth more points because it would be four different colored. And what's that? One, four, nine, 16? 16 points for four different colors, I think. So let's end my turn. It's Alex's turn. The Enforcer dropped off with no effect. Alex knows we're pretty close to the end of the game because of the collision that's about to occur on Larry's board. And, that, and Alex knows that when that happens, she's going to gain... If she has criminal icons on her player board, she's going to gain a debt. Which means another minus two points. I think I definitely want to do something other than a trade. So I'm going to play my thief and get another criminal. That's going to cause me to gain three corruption. One, two, three. One for every criminal icon on my player board. One, two, three, corruption. Oh, I have to move one space. I've got three wild icons to work with. I will move here. I will perform a build action. I've got three builder icons, three criminal icons effectively. I have no stone to spend. And one icon from the Swindler is of no value. So basically, I'm playing, I'm building another, my third workshop is what it looks like. I'm going to gain a virtue. I have only one place where I can put it. I haven't demonstrated how these links work yet. Um, maybe I can still have, I still have time to demonstrate that. Um, for now, I'm going to construct this workshop and it has to go in this one and only space where I'm going to gain one virtue. So it's going to get placed there automatically. Uh, also, that was the, sp the workshop space that allows me to discard a card. I'll discard the Abbot since I have no intent of doing a transcription at any, any time soon. And there was my uh, virtue that I gained thanks to the building spot. Now I have the option of, of recruiting the Swindler. Can't afford, so I will say no. And it's now Larry's turn. Is a collision going to happen here? Are we going to trigger the end of the game? Uh, Larry's Abbott is dropping off. No effect. Larry's going to play. Uh, Larry has a bunch of traitor icons. Still has this cleric benefit. Now, I want to stay on the virtuous path here, so I want to play one of these two cards. I'm going to play the Watchman, which allows me to move one space. I can move here. Great. I will do a build action. I will dismiss the Swindler, since I've got plenty of silver to spare for one builder icon. Oh, there's another criminal. Oh, well. Uh, I will pay two stone to get my other two builder icons, and I will construct, again, my work second workshop, which triggered, which would gain me a virtue um, when a collision occurs. And that's going to allow me to build it here or here. And I want to build it here to show what happens when you create a link. So when you create a link, in other words, I'm building here and there's another building over here and there's a link icon between them shown by these dotted lines. When that happens, the player, the other, the player who owns the other building get, gets that benefit and you get that benefit. Now, if I happen to own both buildings on either side of the link, I would get the benefit once, not twice. Um, but I'm going to go here to gain a deed, which is going to gain me another point. And then both Alex and I are going to gain a virtue. 
and that's going to cause a collision as you can see so that is going to trigger the end of the game but i still that's going to one more round has to occur and that's the round where i want to come back around and either decide to get this black uh, this black ribboned manuscript or this blue ribbon manuscript so the collision occurs but well, first of all the recruitment phase do i want to recruit the trickster i do not so i get three deeds and a silver as a result that's three points uh alex gets one corruption so alex has dropped down to one space separating on her on her board and I reset my markers let's make sure oops and a reshuffle occurs which causes me to gain another virtue because I have no criminals on my board she may not be able to overcome all these negative points and I think yeah so now we're now we're out of deeds so this we we finished the current round which is now finished because I'm the last player Alex was the starting player so now we're moving into the last round of the game and alex has to make this count uh, alex's antagonist dropped off no effect so what do i want to play i have three gold and one inkwell i think i want to perform Oh. oh yes i want to perform a worker action unfortunately i don't have any oh darn it any cards with worker icons but i do have three gold to spend uh, can i pull this off um move two spaces yeah 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 i, I can do it all right, so what I'm thinking of uh, thinking of is uh, if I move here, I've got three gold. I can dismiss the debt collector for one more icon. It's going to cost me two silver to do that. And I have two of the, the uh, criminals on my player board are going to give me the other icons I need. Okay, so I'm good. So uh, I have one criminal on my player board. So I'll play the laborer because I want to move two spaces. Okay, which is going to move me here and then here. See, this is what I have my eye on. If I can flip a debt, that's going to give me the debt the flip debt majority, which is what scores the the bonus at the end of the game, and that's worth twelve points having the majority. I've got one flip debt and Larry has one flip debt. So um, currently it's tied, but not for long. Larry didn't see that happening. I am going to perform a worker action. I am going to use the debt, uh, re, uh, dismiss the debt collector for two silver and one icon. Oh, sorry, that was Larry's board. Yeah, I played the laborer. I have the one icon from my criminal, the thief. I just dismissed the, uh, whoever I dismissed, the criminal, which gives me two icons. I could spend three gold to get up to five icons, which allows me to place three workers. One move to the second tier, which allows me to flip a debt to get the flip debt majority. A collision is about to happen. Flipping the deck gains me a resource, so I will choose to gain. Uh, it doesn't really matter. An inkwell, whatever. I'm not recruiting the meddler. Now the collision gets resolved. I'm going to get two silver and another debt, unfortunately. But it could have been worse. Larry has no criminals. Larry's going to gain a virtue and move down to a space of three, separating his icons. I draw back up. 
But it doesn't really matter because now it's the last turn of the game, Larry's last turn. So Larry wanted to do a cleric action, one more manuscript action, which looks like it's going to be Emma. Or do I have anything that I can allow me to flip a debt? So that uh, I got to think about this. That's 12 points for Alex. I've got three gold. Uh, I could potentially come here as well. But I think I'm still okay. I don't know. I'm not going to go through a whole calculation of the ending score. I'm gonna just going to go with what my original plan was. Yeah, I'll play Emma. Now I can move three spaces. And I want to get either here or here. So here gets me a black ribbon, four different colors. And well, let me just make sure. Yeah, four different color. A set of four different colored ribbons is worth 16 points. So I think I'm better off going here than I am to go here at this point. To go here and get the blue ribbon would get me the cleric bonus card, but that only is worth, I think, two icons, which are now worthless to me because it's the last turn of the game, and three points. So I'm better off going here. So that means I have to spend one, two, I want to go one, two, three, four spaces. I can move three. So I have to spend one silver to move the fourth. So that's now one, two, three, four. Manuscript action. Got one icon thanks to Emma. I could dismiss the, the traitor, which would allow me to re, you know, move my, uh, rearrange my, or do a shuffle. Let me think about this. Doing a shuffle would cause me to gain another virtue. If I could collect, make another collision happen, I could gain a couple more, a bunch of deeds, and make Alex gain another debt. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I'm going to be gaining that much. Still, I will pay the two silver to dismiss the traitor. Get the one icon, cause the reshuffle, gain the one virtue as a result. Then I will spend one inkwell to get my cleric icon count up to three, which is enough to buy this black ribbon, which gains me a deed and another point for that. Then the recruitment phase. So recruiting would allow me to get this patron for three silver. With a discard effect, no benefit to that. So I don't think there's any benefit to me gaining the uh, patron at this point. And that's it. So now we move to the final scoring and we see what happens. Alex pulled it off. 35 to 31. Hmm. Well, okay, let's make sure that this is all correct. So Larry scored five points for buildings. When I scored two, I placed two of my workshops. Placing two workshops is worth five points. That's where I got five points for those. Then I score for workers in the castle. I, have, I never placed additional workers. I just had the two that I started with. So that's worth two points. Two workers in the first tier worth two points one one point for each that's two uh, different colored manuscripts I, I have a set of four a yellow a blue a, a gray and a black that's worth 16 which leaves me with one blue by itself is worth one point so that's 17 points that's correct I had one unpaid debt minus two I had nine deeds that were not flipped that's worth nine points 
I didn't have the majority of flip death, so I got zero for prosperity, which is what this card is called. Uh, uh, the card that's revealed when uh, the, the card that's revealed when the uh, debts when the deeds run out. So this shows you the, that the player who is in first place gets 12 points. The player who is in second place gets 8. And in a third player game. And that doesn't even happen in a two player game. And in, a, in a three or four player game, the player in third place gets 4 points. Uh, there are also points to be had if you have... Remember, if you had a cleric bonus card, those are worth 3 points. Uh, if you have the castle leader card, meaning the most workers in the center of the castle, so let's take a look at Alex's uh, player board. So he got nine points worth of building, so he placed all three of his workshops. That's worth nine points. 16 points from castle workers. He had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight workers in the tier one. That's eight points. One, two, three, four workers in the second tier. That's worth another eight points. Eight plus eight is 16. That's how he got to 16. His unpaid debts, five of them, cost him 10 points. But he had five deeds worth five points. And one deed that got flipped worth three points. I think that was from the beginning of the game. And he got the key 12 points for the most number of flipped debts worth 12 points for that majority, which is what put him over the edge. Alex won the game by a score of 35 to 31. And that's how Viscounts of the uh, West Kingdom works. And that's the third game in the trilogy. And what do I think? So as I said, I thought the first game in the trilogy, Architects, was just too simple, simplistic for my taste. So I don't really care for that game. I would say between Paladins and this one, Paladins by a long shot, at least because of that's the kind of game I like. I do like interesting mechanisms, but I don't know. The, the, this game just felt a little too repetitive to me. I played it a couple times over the course of my debugging, and I played it now. I mean, it is interesting. But I, I, I just, Paladins is more my kind of style of game. So it really is just comes down to what, what's your taste in gaming. Uh, if you like simp simpler games, clearly Architects was a game for you. Um, that was a good game in and of itself. Uh, had some interesting mechanisms, the whole sending people off to jail and whatnot. There are a lot of things uh, happening here, you know, playing cards to your player board, keeping track of your icons, keeping track of your movement, the randomization of the board, how the cards come out, whether you're playing for virtue or playing for corruption. Uh, maybe this one's going to get weighted a little heavier than Paladins, but Paladins is more my style. There you go. If you have any interest in seeing another playthrough of Paladins, or maybe I'll... Maybe I'll record a playthrough if I play it online with my friends at some point because I have finished the programming on that game, so I could always do it that way. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye for now.